Okay, I have six o'clock. So I'm going to start this meeting. And welcome to the November 10th school committee meeting. And I don't have any announcements except to say that uh, we have an executive session on the agenda, but we do not have to go into executive session tonight. So we will be, I know it's going to be an earlier evening. We will be adjourning from this session. Okay. Um, Dr. LeClear, do you have any announcements? Oh, um, Shannon? We have to roll call in. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a goof. All right, let's roll call in before I start this meeting. Shame on me. Shannon. Shannon Dunham here. Marissa. Marissa Carreri here. Lori. Lori Garcia here. Marin. Marin Goldstein here. Jonathan. Jonathan Schmidt here. Cynthia Kwasinski here. And let's see who's in the waiting room. Okay, no, it's not the mayor yet. Okay. All right, so now, thank you, Shannon. We are starting this meeting. Um, and Dr. LeClaire, do you have any announcements? Just a reminder to everyone that tomorrow is Veterans Day and there will be no school for students. So just wanted to make sure that families were um, aware of that. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. And our next meeting is December 8th. All right. So let's open up public speak. Um, we're going to ask for a three minute limit if anybody would like to talk. And let me let everybody in. And um, anybody would like to talk, please signal. And we will hear you. I do not see anybody right now. Okay. Marissa, I don't think you see anybody. So going once, going twice. Able to? Oh, Carrie, did you want to talk? Sure. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carrie Damon. I've got um, four children in the district and just uh, hoping to hear tonight uh, the committee's response to um, the updated governor's orders that were released last week um, in an effort to get the kids uh, back to school. I'm just certainly noticing it's getting more challenging as the weeks and months uh, go on uh, fully remote. So just hoping that we hear an update this evening and thank you all once again for your work. I know it's... Um, it's a lot. We do appreciate all that you all are doing. So thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay. I'll scroll through one last time and then we'll close public speak if I don't see anybody's signal. Okay. All right. Okay. We maybe have somebody else. Can I? Did you see somebody? Oh, there's Megan. Okay, go ahead, Megan. Hi, sorry, I couldn't find the hand raising. So <laughs> That's fine. Clapping and excuse the children in the background. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to um, express my hope that uh, full um, evaluations be given tonight of bringing back first graders in light of the rising case numbers. Um, you know, in addition to what Desi has updated in the past couple of weeks, uh, we've also seen some pretty dramatic trends going around in the state. Um, and as a parent, of, I have a couple of kids in the district, but as a parent of a first grader, knowing that this sort of upheaval is coming, you know, he's going to stay home, but his classmates may or may not be in the classroom, and then they may get sent home again. Uh, I was just hoping or requesting that there would be a full sort of thought process um, about if that's still a wise decision. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Heather? Hi. Um, I'm just hoping to hear something tonight about um, winter sports. I'm just hoping that it happens, and I'm hoping to hear what you have to say. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Check one last time. 
It's always nice to have an extra set of eyes because I could miss somebody. Okay. Okay. Um, we are going to close public speak. Thank you. All right. And now for subcommittee updates. Uh, I um, Finance hasn't met. So um, there's no update for that. But we have a number of policy um, updates that you want to make, right, Shannon? Yes, yeah, please. Okay. We'll do yours first, and then I'll ask Lori and Jonathan. Okay, just so you guys know, this is the last group of the requirements um, for the policies that needed to be updated for a supplement that um, MASC distributed back in June. Um, we had to update our policies before we could accept the supplement. So I will try to be as quick as I can with these. Um, I'd like to make a motion for first reading on IJND. I second that. Okay, Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa. Marissa Cray, aye. Lori. Lori Garcia, aye. Marin. Aaron Goldstein, aye. Jonathan. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. And I just wanted to make a mention, Nicole's on her way. Um, <laughs> I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add IJNDB. I second that. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa. Marissa Gray, aye. Lori. Lori Garcia, aye. Mary. Goldstein, aye. Jonathan. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cindy Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add IJNDC. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Gray, aye. Lori Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cindy Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion to delete for the first reading to delete KMA. I second that. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Gray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cindy Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add ID. I second that. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Okay, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to update IKF. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add ECA. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kosinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add JLCB. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kosinski, aye. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to delete JEC. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kusinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add JF. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Aaron Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion for the first reading to add JLCA. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Curry, aye. Larry Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I'd like to make a motion to for the first reading to update JF. A, B, F. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Lori Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. 
Okay, this last one is the actual supplement. Um, again, there are paragraphs in the supplement um, that instead of adding to each individual um, policy, it's just an addendum for COVID related issues. So I'd like to make the first, uh, make a motion for the first reading to add EBC dash S. I second that. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Laurie Garcia, aye. Aaron Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Cynthia Kuczynski, aye. Okay. Um, so, Lori, do you have an update for us? No, I don't have an update. I just want to once again thank Megan Harvey for being so willing to contribute the metrics that she provides us with weekly. And she really is a stellar addition that we couldn't be without on our COVID response team, especially in light of mid-air, our um, governor and commissioner of education changing metrics, which makes absolutely no sense. So I value having Megan who brings science to us. Thanks again, Megan. And I second that. Thank you very much. Hello, Amir. Um, and that's okay. We know you're busy. Um, Jonathan, you don't have a collaborative update or do you? Um, no, we will be meeting uh, next week on the 18th. Um, I'll also just let anybody know that they're holding a uh, sort of virtual um, retirement party, I guess, for executive director Bill Deal um, on December 9th. If anybody was interested in um, attending that, I know, Cindy, you've yep. uh, served on the collaborative before, so I'd be happy to send along information about that if you want. Please do. I would like to. He's been an excellent leader. Please. So thank you. Um, so now we have an MCAS testing school year update. Is that is that me, Mayor? Is that me, um, Cindy? I, I think so. I think you're looking at the draft agenda. I don't think we have that on the new agenda. I think that was the draft agenda. That's why I was I was I didn't know if you were reviewing the letter again from Marissa. Hmm. I think that's oh no, I think you're right. It's C, yep. I'm cast testing school year. I think that was in reference to the letter, Cindy. Okay, it's not in reference to the scheduling of January testing. No. Okay. Okay, then Marissa, do we have an update? On the um, MCAS element? I don't yeah. have an update, no. Okay, okay. Um, and do you foresee an update soon in terms of, I know they're offering January and spring um, testing. Uh, I'm awaiting further information from the commissioner, okay. yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, email correspondence? That's me. Um, I was bringing to the committee for discussion um, just a minor but I think important procedural change. Um, we acknowledge publicly during our meetings the correspondence that we receive by snail mail um, as a committee, but we don't acknowledge email correspondence and of course the vast majority of the ways that we are hearing from the public is via email. Um, and so I would propose that um, as part of the secretarial duties that I or whoever is serving in this role in the future would um, just uh, compile a list of emails that we have received from, from people in our community um, between meetings and just list their name and a very brief summary, you know, just a phrase that summarizes the nature of their question or concern um, as a way to make sure that everyone knows that we are indeed receiving their emails and that it, it sort of brings it into the conversation of our meeting each, each session. I think that's a great idea. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I, I think we could easily do it. Dr. LeClaire? I was just going to ask um, if the email that you receive is does not have a name attached to it. I think right. that should maybe be um, kind of vetted out. I think that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And I'm talking specifically about um, people from the community who've written to the full committee in a way that right. then that is, you know, that's 
public record. Sure. Um, I, I don't see that as something that we have to have a vote on procedurally, okay. um, but I think if everybody's in agreement, we'll just start that. Sounds great. Sure. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. I mean, that seems pretty minor. Um, okay, superintendent updates. Okay. Um, could I please have the power to share my screen in a few minutes? Yep. And uh, let me start tonight with something very important. The, um, the memo that you received from Tom Brown, who is the chair of the school building committee. Uh, if you recall, and for people watching, um, we did a survey recently around naming of the new pre-K through eight school building. We had over 700 responses. We had given name suggestions, and we also had a place for other, and we had some really great responses or ideas come out of the other category. And one name that rose to the top is uh, the, the following name. So I'm gonna just read you this memo from Tom Brown from the School Building Committee. It is my understanding that you will be considering a name for the new pre-K through eight school at your meeting this evening. The school building committee understands that the decision for the name lies with the school committee. I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that after reviewing the community survey and discussions at our last meeting, the school building committee unanimously recommended that the name of the new school be Mountain View School. Thank you for your consideration and for all the work you do for the students of East Hampton. So it is the recommendation of the school building committee that the name of the new school be the Mountain View School. So that is uh, the proposed name to you and it is your charge to decide if you would like to um, vote on that. Shannon? I just really quickly wanted to go over, um, we did update the policy um, based on MASC, you know, their recommendation um, last year. And I just wanna let people know, we saw a lot of um, people's names um, that they wanted to use as a um, possibility for the new school. And just so everybody knows that we can't, um, it's actually against policy. And for so East Hampton, knows. yeah. yeah. Just so everyone realizes that. And I think it's important to um, also point out that school committee members that serve on the school building committee, Shannon Dunham, Marin Goldstein, Cindy Kwasinski, um, and of course the mayor is on that committee. So I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything um, to the conversation. Marin? I'll just add, I think, you know, I think that they're definitely uh, of the others, the creative ones. Um, I think that there was a lot of really strong desire to look forward to be sort of moving in a new way, a new school name, not something that was sort of connected to the past um, or sort of uh, carried any connotations with it. So it was really a, a positive discussion about a forward looking name. Um, I will say that I, I, I really like the Mountain View part, but the rest of it still, we, we definitely had conversations about whether it should be Mountain View Community School or something else. And I've always, I've sort of still feel like Mountain View is like the perfect beginning, but I want something more. I want something, it's such a beautiful big school and it incorporates both our elementary and our middle school. Um, so I've always sort of felt, I've been, I've been trying to struggle for the last couple of weeks with what would be more, what could add something to that. Um, I don't know if something, if this becomes too big to say Mountain View Elementary and Middle School or something like that, but I've, it just felt Mountain View Schools fell a little too short for me. I'll just add that though. Thank you. Uh, Shannon? If I can just add on to what um, Marin said, um, I actually thought a lot about that. Um, and I know that um, the reason we're choosing it now is because we needed to make space in the school itself. 
um, uh, for signage. But what I was thinking, um, possibly, you know, Mountain View School on the inside, and then like the sign up front, um, adding something to just kind of explain more what it is. Um, I've heard a lot of people say community, and honestly, it sounds awfully pretentious. <laughs> um, but also, Marin, I don't remember who it was that said it at the meeting, um, but it it's already part of the community. So we didn't want um, to add the community to make it seem like we're trying to, if that makes sense. Yeah, the key place that's needing right now is that they're, they're in, the, in the construction phase, they're about to put the electrical in um, and they need to have the number of uh, exact letters and spacing of this name on the front of the building because they're going to, I guess, light up uh, the name and it has that many outlets and all that. So we can choose a really long name. We can choose a really short name. Just how much electrical work do we want them to do? And I, I just want to be clear. Um, the decision was made already that on the elementary side, it would say in letters above the entrance, elementary school entrance. And on the middle school side, it will say middle school entrance. So we're just talking about the main name that will be, um, you know, on the, the, the front body of the school. But they will be sep there will be separate entrances that will be delineated. I, Jonathan? I was going to say, um, I really appreciate the suggestion of Mountain View, um, sort of to echo Marin's statement. Um, I wanted it to be something, you know, as I was filling out the survey myself, I was really wanted it to be something different than just East Hampton or Park Street. And I agree that sort of holding on to um, the Whitebrook name was sort of put us at risk of kind of holding on to the, the negative connotations that went along with that. So. Um, I just want to express my appreciation to that recommendation. I was personally trying to think of, you know, the unique space and what could be said about it. And um, of course the mountain, uh, so that was um, brilliant. Um, I also echo Marin's statement though about feeling like there's just something missing to it. Um, and I don't have a great answer either. Well, you know, another suggestion might be mountain view pre-K through eight school. Sort of locks us in, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Not that, not that it would ever change, probably, but. Yeah, that's why I wondered if we wanted to spell out Mountain View Middle and Elementary School or something like that. I don't think it's necessarily needed for the building itself. Um, like I said, perhaps the signage at the top of the map the top of the hill, you know, where we spell it out that it's elementary and middle. Yeah. And just the signage on the building is just Mountain View School. Lori, Marissa. I mean, I love, I love it. I love the Mountain View. Um, I'm trying to think in my head about this other element. Um, I'm always thinking about just like letterhead and, and quick abbreviations, you know, the WMS, the EHS. And so the PK through eight would add a little extra challenge if we're trying to um, refer to it in shorthand. Um, Look at this point. Point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lori? Yeah. The mayor has her hand up first. Oh, okay. no, no. Lori, go ahead. I can wait. No, I just, I echo everyone's sentiments that I love the name Mountain View. I'm just wondering if there were any other names that were in the final running. I know people contacted me. Some people were hoping that we had a Native American name assigned. I just wonder what the discussions were like dealing with that. But once again, I love Mountain View. I think I I think if you're if you're asking me and I would I would let the other people on the committee chime in, Park Street School, or Park Street Community School, were some of the top names. Yes, there were some other names um, that were put forward, but again, I think Shannon's point, not um, identifying a specific person in the naming um, element, was. Um, was something that we kind of um, did not really, we kind of looked past some of those 
there were some other great names that were put forward besides um, Native American names or in addition to Native American names. Um, yeah, there were a lot of great suggestions, but it was, we tried to look at the ones that were the most popular, the ones that, that kind of uh, we felt um, with an eye towards a new beginning. And the, the word view in it really indicates that. So I love that. And I do agree that if we have it so long, you know, pre-K through eight on the building, that would be very long. But I do like the idea of having a sign at the road that labels even those grades now, because those type of signs can be changed if yeah. need be. Yeah. Mayor? Um, I, I love the simplicity of Mountain View School, just as it is. I think about our current schools, um, you know, you hear Maple Street, Center Pepin, um, East Hampton, high, like we're not taught, well, high school, I mean, the, um, you know, I, I think that the, over time, it will, you know, be Mountain View School and, you know, one of two schools. Um, I mean, I, I hear the identification and, and I totally forgot that over the, the doors, it was going to say elementary and, and middle. And that kind of took away for me, the concern that I'm, I'm hearing, but the Mountain View school, just for me, um, it just sounds, it, it sounds so strong. And, and there's the school that, you know, the, the school that looks strong um, with a backdrop of the mountain and the idea of view and vision and education really, it resonates with me. I, I, I like the clarity and um, like Marissa, I was thinking short, I'm thinking, hmm, MVS. Like huh? that could be, you know, like you, all the little kids t-shirts and MVS. So um, I don't know how important that is, but yeah. you know, I, I do the, the clarity and strength of that name. Um, I don't know. I think it. I think it reflects the clarity and strength of our school department. Yeah. I do. My myself. I like the. I really like the name. Um, I think it fits the site beautifully. Um, I like the idea of putting on the front sign. You know, middle and elementary school, Mountain View, middle and elementary school, but on the building, just leaving it with um, Mountain View. So does anyone want to make a motion? Well, could uh, uh, just clarification before the motion. So are we talking about like a school, I mean, a, like Mountain View School and then almost like underneath it, like, uh, like elementary and middle school? No, no. You know, the front sign at the, so you put Mountain View School and you put middle and elementary on the sign that's at the road, but on the building, it just says Mountain View School. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that's what everybody's talking yes. about. Because the because that area is going to get electrical put to it. That's why they're needing it now, because it's going to be right. lit up. I'm right. not sure exactly right. where in the facial area that is, so I just don't know it's, how that's going to be in representation of the middle versus elementary yeah. entrances. Yeah. Um, it's going to be in in the um, in front of like the wellness center, the adaptive PE space. So there's that sort of larger gym level yes. in that area, yes. and that's where that's going to be. Kind of protrudes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. You're and the elementary and middle are. entrances will those letters will already be backlit. We already arranged that. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion to name the new school Mountain View School. I'll second that. All right, roll call. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa? Yes, okay, aye. <laughs> Laurie Garcia, aye. Mayor and Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Mayor? Nicole Ashfeld, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. We have a name for a school, yay. So exciting. It is. I can't believe we're naming the school. <laughs> no. Now it'll feel it'll feel real because we've been yeah, calling it Maple realer. School yeah. for a long time. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it, it sounds so nice. I'm going to drive over to Mountain View. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, there will be beautiful, majestic views of the mountains. Mm -hmm. So it'll be really be fitting. Okay. Um, so next on my section of the agenda is the um, return to school 
plan or update that I promised to provide you. Uh, so let me just bring that up. So I just want to, I know that some, some parents might be waiting on this call tonight, so I wrote a few notes. We are not discussing winter sports tonight, so if that's the reason you're on the school committee call, you don't need to stay. It's not on the agenda, and we specifically did not put it on the agenda tonight because we don't have all the information from the MIAA, and I don't feel it's fair to ask the school committee to make a decision when um, the MIAA hasn't issued the final guidance. So they hadn't, as of the time uh, this was, this, this agenda was published. So sports, I know there was a parent that brought it up, that will be on the December 8th agenda. Um, and so- Dr. LeClaire, I'm yeah. sorry, can I just add something to that statement? Because yes. we did receive a very nice email from a senior swimmer. Yep. And I did not respond because I wanted to double check, but I know that our swim team uses Williston and there is no way that Williston will be opening the pool this year. So that was a correct to... statement. Williston will not be opening their facilities to us at all. Right. So, um, this is an update on the phased reopening. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. I believe I should. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have just a reminder, we brought special populations and pre-K back into the high school location already. October 26th, um, kindergarten returned and our some of our ELL students. We also um, piloted the remote learning center for a few select high school students. We had a staff member that could man that, and we had some students that really um, needed to have some place to um, kind of come and, and kind of shore up some of the work they were doing in classes. So that is up and running with a handful of students. On November 19th, we're proposing to bring back grade one. Um, and we will also be starting the remote learning center for the elementary students. This is all at the high school. And I can share this document with all of you. Um, if I didn't already, I might have already. But this is um, all going to be at the high school. For grade one, we have about 40% of our students returning. And because that number was slightly less than what we anticipated, we were able to condense um, the cohorts down. And uh, what that means is that every teacher that teaches first grade will teach one cohort to start with. And that means that they will be in the building two days per week. And then the rest of their week is remote. And that will give uh, students and staff five days between um, when they see students in person. And then we are tentatively scheduling the remote learning center for the middle school level, also at the high school. That's scheduled to, to open November 23rd, which uh, I apologize, I didn't put that date in here. So we have, I'm, I'm saying three different remote learning centers because we have three different classrooms that will be used with three different staff. We wanna keep the numbers low. We wanna keep it age appropriate. So we're, um, we're spacing them out at the high school. They're actually going to be in the computer labs, which we had not uh, set up for kindergarten, preschool or first grade, obviously, because they have a lot of computers in them, but they will work out to be a good spot for the learning centers. So that's our current plan. That's what we have discussed in this meeting already. And here is the projected plan um, going forward. After the holiday break, it's our hope to be back into our individual schools. So on January 4th, we propose bringing back special populations, pre-K, K and one, back into their home schools. 
and move the remote learning center for the elementary students back to one of the buildings. Then we'll wait a week and we'll add grades two through 11, two through four, I'm sorry, the following week. Um, so the rest of the elementary grades will come in in mid-January. Then our next phase will be the following week. We'll begin with grades five and six at Whitebrook and bring the Whitebrook Remote Learning Center back. Um, and then January 28th, which is the semester change, it's, it's the start of the new semester, we'll bring back grades seven through 12. It says cohort B starts because January 28th is a Thursday. So the B group would start first, and that would be at Whitebrook in the high school. Here are the variables that we are considering in this work. The projected timeline assumes that we will be able to make any adjustments to HVAC systems or air ventilation upgrades to occupy our normal schools. Our schools have been um, evaluated and we're just waiting for the phase two report. If we're unable to make the upgrades um, or to secure the necessary equipment, or if we face the challenge of being unable to occupy a specific space or building, the plan will need to be adjusted. That's obvious. And also we're looking at um, our health metrics. We're keeping a, an eye on the health metrics in our area. I think this, um, I feel that this proposed schedule is um, appropriate given the information that we have today. We all have heard the information from the governor and the commissioner um, that we should be aiming to be back in school now. Um, we do not have the ability in East Hampton to come back fully in person unless some variables change. Um, and I don't see any indication that they will. And those variables are the six foot separation between students and the, um, the busing challenges. We have to have a student, you know, we have to have um, half the students or less than half the students on a bus. If those variables don't change in the coming months, we can't bring all our students back fully in person. Um, we can only do hybrid until that until those those regulations change. We don't have an overflow of additional space. Um, we have some extra space, but we don't have enough to um, put all the students back fully in person. 100% um, and keep six foot distance. So uh, until those, those metrics or those variables change, we can't, um, we can't shift, but we can move safely or, or I feel appropriately to a hybrid plan. Um, and I think that this allows us the time to get the rooms to where we need them to be if you recall, we're running out of space at the high school, so we can't continue to put classes there. This gives us time to get through the holidays, which has been expressed by some that, uh, you know, they want, some people are holding their children back because they're going to be visiting with family over the holidays, so they don't want to start their children in school over Thanksgiving um, or going into, into um, December. So this is what I am bringing forward to you this evening. And, you know, I hope that you will consider it as we move forward. I think it, I, I hope this gives families some idea of what we are hoping to um, accomplish in the coming months. So I'll take any questions if anyone has questions or comments. Um, nobody has questions? I, I do. Okay, good. Um, I'll let you start. Okay. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, I'm just, I have the, um, the November 2nd health metric chart up. Is, I, is that the latest? I'm assuming it is, right? Um, I sent you one today. Are you talking about the ones that come, that come from Megan Ward? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, we did we receive have, one today. We should have this week's. Uh, yep. Let me see if I can. Let me see. You can all see my email right now. I know. But I'm just bringing up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yep. That? Yes. Yeah. So that's as of, I don't think the date's on it, but it, it's from Monday. Yep. The 9th. Okay, so um, my um, uh, my uh, okay, so uh, I don't know where to start. Um, so I have. Can you scroll down a little bit? Yes. So under the um, Oops. under the do, 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 time to test results. And it being under 48 hours in Western Mass, that's not the case. So even, well, even like, so I was confused about when we're talking about hybrid or we're talking about even phased in for special populations, we, we don't get tests back in 48 hours. Um, it's a fluke more than it is reality. So I'm a, I'm a little worried about that. And there's also some confusion in the community about your test. And even if it's negative, but you've had close contact, there's still some regulation around staying outside of, of um, you know, school or, or quarantining. And, and I, I ask these, I ask them as questions. I'm, I'm not, yes. um, so I'm, I'm wondering about the turnaround. And that has been an issue that that we've been dealing with outside of the school system and with members of our staff and public safety who have had a close contact. Um, we're still waiting three to five days. Um, although the statewide average for return on test is uh, like, I think it's 2.1, but it, it, it's variable. So I brought that to the state's attention um, to say, you know, Bay State and Hoyoke Medical in particular are not getting the support they need to get those tests turned around on a regular basis within 48 hours, never mind 72. So that, that worries me. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering how, how that um, turns. And, and then so also the new state metrics. So if the metrics hadn't changed on Friday, as of Thursday under old metrics, East Hampton would have gone red. Yes, um, I believe you are correct. Yep. Yeah, and correct. the truth of three. So in the last two weeks, East Hampton has had an increase of cases like no other two week period since the beginning of this pandemic. And and that's a concern. And they're talking about community transition happening within households. And and again, I say to bring up these issues, I, I'm just wondering what the wellness committee um like how does that how do my statements relate to the November 9th um, uh, chart we, we have? So I'm glad, uh, can I just, oh, go ahead, Laurie. No, you started, Dr. LeClaire, go on. <laughs> I think you brought up a few really important points that I would like to um, address because I think that uh, there are a couple important nuances to, to let you know about. So right now, the students that are coming into the school building mm -hmm. um, have, their families have completed a health screening. If the answer is yes to anything on the screening form, the paper is given to the nurse as the child, you know, arrives, either in the, you know, getting off the bus, getting out of the car. And if the child, if, if the answer is yes on anything on that form, the child is immediately directed to the nurse station and the family is called. So the child never even makes it into the classroom setting until they're cleared by, we have at least two nurses on staff welcoming the students into the building. Now the nurses have been doing a tremendous job um, with assessing the needs of students, communicating with families, working with our staff. And I will say that I think the benefit of having the RNs working so closely with families um, that are 
in school, staff members that are in school, if questions arise, such as um, my partner is a close contact, then our nursing staff can direct them immediately. This is what you need to do, X, Y, and Z. So they have, they oversee and provide that information and guidance to staff, to families, um, any communication yeah. that they get with our families, they'll call the family and say, okay, this is what you need to do and s spell it all out for them. Because I believe the mayor is correct that not everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do. If they're defined as a close contact, what does that mean? Yeah. How many days do I stay home? How do I know if I'm a close contact? Our nurses are on site to be that resource for families okay. and they're doing an exceptional job with that. Number two, the Department of Ed put out a call for um, communities that were in any type of hybrid or in-person learning and said that we will be providing um, a small amount of tests that we will make available to school districts if you are interested. Our nurses went through all the steps they needed to go through to be part of phase one. And so we will have, um, a, it won't be a lot, and it's not a preventative test. It's not to screen everyone. It is if they suspect that a student may be ill or a staff member, they will have access to testing on site. Um, the third one is that, the, the third point I would make is that if schools do have a breakout, there is a mobile testing unit that will come on site um, and do testing of staff and students and the Department of Ed is deploying them all over the state. I know that I live in a community in Western Mass that has uh, shut down because of some cases, um, they've shut down school and they have a mobile testing site coming in this week. Um, so they will do immediate testing of all, uh, all community uh, students and staff in the, in the school community. Um, so I think those are all important facets to understand. And I think it is important to um, look at, and, and, and the mayor can, can allude to this as well, you know, I look at the types of cases we have. I don't look at, I don't see names or any private information about COVID cases in the city of East Hampton, but I am in constant contact with um, our health person, our health director, and mm -hmm. I understand what some of the makeup is. So, you know, she gives me uh, feedback on how we're doing. And, you know, I have had conversations with her about whether she feels comfortable with what we're what we're proposing to do, and she has given me um, insight into the work that we're doing. She feels very comfortable with our nursing staff. She feels very comfortable with the mm -hmm. PPE training that we're doing of all staff. Um, you know, with the guidelines that we're following. I think it's important that you know if we have a week in the red, even two weeks in the red. That doesn't necessarily mean that we need to shut everything down. If we are containing the spread of the virus within our schools, then the students should be allowed to continue to be in school. And right now we don't have any cases of COVID transmission in our schools. Yes, we have a very small population, but we are doing the right things. And that's been assessed by our RNs, that's been assessed by our health agent. Our administrators are following up with our teachers and our staff every day. So I feel very confident in what I'm putting forward to the group. Um, Lori? I feel as the school committee member on the COVID response team, it's my duty to report what the epidemiologist, Megan Harvey, sent to us this week. She stated that she was very comforted to know, and I don't want to bring politics in, but we do have something to look forward to. 
with the president elect who has a COVID response plan now that he wants to enact immediately when he is sworn in. And he wants to call on Congress to pass an emergency package to ensure schools have the additional resources they need to adapt effectively to COVID-19. That is part of his plan. We don't need to wait for a mobile response unit then to come and act when we've already had a spread. I'm not saying that we need to wait all year. Our epidemiologist is hopeful that we can enter the schools safely in February. And in her words, we should hunker down until then. She is the only member of our COVID response team who actually is a specialist in preventing the spread of disease. I appreciate fully that we have RNs who are doing all they can to help us have our students in safely in our schools. And they are doing a wonderful job, but I do not mean to seem cynical, but a teacher who has been in the classroom for th more than 30 years, I have seen countless times students sitting in front of me who are sick and their parents knew and they sent them in. So I'm not confident that all parents will fill out those forms the way that they should and that the way that they need to be dealt with if they feel that they can't go to work if their child has symptoms and they can't send them to school. And that's just reality. So I, once again, I've said this many times, I want our students back in the classrooms, but I want them in the classroom safely. And also the studies that were cited by our governor and our commissioner of education are faulty studies. There was a study done over the weekend that, that documented how those were done in the summer. They were done in European communities and there was evidence that it was not true that students did not spread COVID-19 because as we know, they can be asymptomatic and they can be spreading without our even knowing. So I, once again, this is not opinion, this is scientific fact from the epidemiologist on our COVID response team that we should remain hunkered down until February. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a quick question, uh, Allison. What's your compliance on filling out those papers? How many families are actually completing them my guess is 100, it's not 100%. You're getting students 100%? Come, yeah, students can't come in uh, to the classroom unless they have it done. And if they come without their paper in their backpack, the nurse stops them, they, uh, they call the family, and they go through the questions over the phone with the family. Okay. Um, so... I'm just going to kind of jump in here and um, I am profoundly number one disappointed in the um, the Baker Riley um, announcement and the reforming of the metrics. I think that what happened, in fact, I can uh, throw out numbers. Um, what happened is that too many cities went red and they decided that we've got to fix it. Um, the intent was that it, they would adjust it to um, cities and towns. Um, we're working with it ourselves in my district. Um, this makes no sense. And I'll give you a perfect example. So the, my concern, I'm bringing it up, Allison, because you talked about if we go red. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, October 22nd, Holyoke was red at 12 cases per 100,000. Um, on the next week, on the 29th, Holyoke was at 17.9. And again, it was red. But now we redo all those numbers and all those metrics, and Holyoke has 30 cases, 30.9, okay, is the number, not cases, but cases per 100,000, and it's yellow. 
So what they've done is they've taken a number of weeks, because each one is a two week uh, piece of data. And we went from red, red with much lower numbers to much, much higher numbers. And now we change the color to yellow, safe to go, just do it cautiously. They did the same thing for, I mean, it, it, this this had repercussions for every, every city. I keep this um, every week. So I'll give you another example. Westfield was red at 8.9 on the 22nd. On the 29th, West, Westfield was red with 15.3 as a number. Now, on the, this last one, Westfield has 17.3, more cases going up every single week, and it's yellow. So the idea that we're going to use the new metrics to make these decisions about safety, to me, just is absurd. I can tell you I was flabbergasted when I saw these and I saw how the numbers play out. Um, in every single case, we can trace every single city that has gone up, and those that were red are now yellow. Those that are yellow and have held in that range are now green, and it's just absurd, and I don't understand it. I agree with Lori. The cases uh, of the research that they cited was not quality research and it's not recent research. It is simply a political decision to um, put pressure on schools to get everybody back in. The idea that they also, the statement that they want kids in five days a week is impossible because you cannot maintain six foot distance and we know that's how to keep the kids and the teachers safe. So the idea that they are pushing schools to do this, I was appalled. I think Massachusetts has done an incredibly great job of trying to handle this up until this last announcement. And I was appalled. And so I, I don't know what we're going to do with this. I, I listen, my school is hybrid and if we can get kids in, I'm all for it. I really, really am. But I don't want us to decide that we're going to um, look at the new metrics as the, the guideline when all they've done without any research is move the goalpost. So too many cities, I think the number was 39 were in the red. And in one fell swoop, we changed the numbers. Now we brought it down to 16. Um, that kind of moving the goalpost is appalling. And I will be personally um, writing a letter to Commissioner Riley because, and, and to um, Governor Baker because I just, I don't understand it. And... Um, I don't know where to go after this, but I cannot go by these new numbers. I cannot personally trust them. And I don't know how anybody else is feeling, but that's my spiel. Can Mary? I just clarify the, the proposed plan that I put in, that I just showed you was not based on those numbers. It was not based on that day. It was done before. No, but you that. were talking about us being in the red for a period of time, and we're not going to be in the red under these new numbers unless right. we're in horrific. And the, and the reality is, and I want to keep going back to this, is my, my focus is on how safe are we keeping children in school? Are we doing all the things we need to do to mitigate the spread of the disease in the school? wearing masks, hand washing, six foot separation. If we are doing those things and we are containing the spread in the school, then it really, honestly, it, it's not my issue what's going on in the community. I can't yeah. control that. Right. I can control what's going on in the schools. And if I can do that safely, then we should be bringing students back. 
Um, and, Allison, and Allison, before I call on Maren, I just see them as two separate issues. Your plan, I think, is a good plan going forward. That's kind of what we need to talk about, what, what was upsetting. And I just wanted to really talk about and have us, before we have a conversation about this plan, I'd like us to really think about um, how we're going to use the new metrics because that's what I was addressing, is we'll never be read if we go by these new metrics. Go ahead, Miriam. So I first want to agree with you, Cindy. I want to say that the state's decision to change the colors uh, of their map just to sort of make it so that they can have their policy that they desire um, was, was ridiculous uh, and um, definitely um, a decision to try to push forward an agenda that they have had from the beginning um, and that they have not supported us from the state level to achieve that goal of in-school education. Um, they have not supported us by dealing with any kind of negotiations at the state level with the union. They have not dealt with the ability for us to help roll out additional funds to get our schools properly um, uh, upgraded and such to deal with it. So I completely agree that their um, changing of this old goalpost to color, to how they color code things is ludicrous and should not be um, accepted within this community. However, I think it's really important for us to clarify what's being said here because the health metrics themselves, nothing has changed there in terms of how they're gathering the numbers, or how or what that number is. So up to this point, we've been negotiating and reviewing a number and not a color. So I think that's really important as we go forward here is that yes, I have no desire to look to the map and see red versus yellow versus green because that's politics at this point. Um, but we do have a number there and we do have numbers that we've been calculating based off of this. Um, and the numbers of what we've been negotiating with the teachers union. And so those numbers, are, I think, are still factual and still true. Um, and I still stand by the negotiations that we've been having up to this point. I think that they were that they've been well thought out and reviewed. Um, and so even though our community now is going to be considered green instead of yellow or red, um, the number still has us within that area that allows us to have a hybrid education model with our schools. Correct. So that's where I just want to stay really clearly. The state, the state can stay in Boston for all I care. But, you know, for in terms of how we decide who's in our schools, that's for us to decide. And the numbers still are within that area that would allow us to proceed with first grade into our schools right. on Monday. No, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm looking at Megan's, um, Megan's metrics and I agree with you. We have the numbers. I just really want us to go to have a plan that we stick to what we had come up with as safe metrics and stay within those boundaries as we look at um, the plans going forward. And uh, I just had to say, I, I, I'm glad you clarified it because I totally agree with you, but I really do not want us looking at the state's mandate and the, the state's rewrite of the metrics and having the community not see that they're profoundly different. I know that we get emails from people saying, look at we're green, so we should we should be, you know, full in person. And people don't necessarily understand unless they're watching the numbers every single week as we are, as Megan is, as Lori is, you know, Allison, the mayor, I mean, all of us have eyes on this, but not everybody else does. And so I just want us to keep in mind that we've got to do the safe uh, plan that we all had come up with and be guided by real research, not some crazy rewrite. That was it. So thank you, Marin, for that. I agree with you. Anybody want to say anything about the whole plan that going forward or about Baker and Riley? 
I just, first? I just yeah. wanted to ask about our um, most recent metrics table. Um, it seems like the most concerning element there is the cases per 100,000. And so I'm wondering if anyone can speak to how that number is um, matching up with um, what Marin was referring to here about this sort of negotiated number with the union in terms of like, our gold standard. I, I believe, Marissa, that that um, number is, is it broken down into Hampshire and Hamden County? Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. have it. Not, um, yes, have yes. To, we have, to, we, a part of our metrics that are proposed with the union also includes East Hampton separately. Mm -hmm. it's not part of that metric from Megan. Megan is doing this this document um, in a in a slightly different way than than the health metric we'd have agreed upon with the union or proposed. Okay. I do see it has um, five per 100 K in Hampshire and then 8.4 8. Yes. 8. per 100 K in East Hampton specifically. Yeah. yeah and I think uh, the piece that I would just add to in terms of this metrics from Megan versus what we have been working on with the teachers union um, is at least the way I'm reading this um, and is that the virtual learning based on cases per hundred thousand is basically if there is an increasing or stability stably high infection rate so yes we have had an increasing rate um, but because we were so much lower already and even though it's increasing uh, it's still not actually that high um, and so that's where I I have a quite I have had this concern from the very beginning. The only way you can not be in virtual learning by this graph is if you don't have an increasing rate. Well, increasing rate doesn't say where you started or where you're still at. Um, and so that's my concern that this uh, metrics basically automatically forces it into that red line um, if you have an increasing number. I think that's what I'm asking. Um, I would like to know what is the metric that we're using at the county and at the city level? What's the number that we're looking for per 100K? Uh, um, uh, we, can't, we can't say that. We're okay. still, it's still being negotiated. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got but it. I, but I can say that right now we're looking at only one highlighted in the virtual learning. So when we're looking at this, you're looking at most of the highlighted areas are in um, special pops and hybrid. Yeah. So we do have one um, that is that is over by virtual, Lori. I would like to clarify, and I should have reported this when you asked for the report of our last meeting. Uh, Megan did bring up her dismay to bring back all first graders. So I'm glad that a lot of parents have opted to keep their children home. She said the idea would be to have the first graders who are in most desperate need to come back and also in each grade to look at it that way, not look at grade levels, but to look at the special populations within each grade. And that's what she means by saying the special populations. Maybe if I can just add one antidotal piece of information too. Um, I just decided to go get tested just to sort of see what that experience was like, not because I felt I've been exposed or concerned, but I wanted to go have the experience and use uh, the um, Hampshire Community College uh, free testing that's available Monday to Friday. Um, I actually got my re results back within less than 24 hours um, and was in, in a car line for about 45 minutes. And I think that was actually just because I went during the sort of morning rush hour of people trying to get to work. Otherwise, after, as I was leaving about 8 a.m., the line was much, much shorter already. So uh, it seems like you can get tested probably after 8 a.m. and less than a half hour. Um, and at least again, just for my own personal test, it was less than 24 hours to get it back. And Marin, that's wonderful news, but that's what Megan has also been saying. As soon as we can readily test the school population, she said it's safe to bring the kids back to school, but we can't say to our students, you have to get them all tested. I said that to the athletes. But that's what I was talking about February, if we have the funding to readily test our students and our teachers every week, 
then we can be safer. Madam Chair. Yes. Sorry, I'm looking down and thinking, yeah. sorry. No, no, it's fine. I have a, a, a couple of questions, but I also have my own anecdote around testing. I get tested every week, exposed or not, and I've been doing it for a couple of months as my brother, mother, and sister-in-law have done it. Um, our average return day, our average return out of Holyoke Medical and Holyoke Community College is four days. My brother is likely positive with COVID-19 and was tested and it took him three days when referred by a doctor. I think that the turnaround time for testing is incredibly variable. And it depends on how many tests go to the Broad, to MIT, to Quest. Bay State is overloaded on any given day on returning the tests. And that said, and I, I don't know if, if people know this or not, but my grave concern about the increase of, of cases in the city of East Hampton is to the point where I have collaborated with Williston and every Wednesday between 2.30 and 3.30, any city employee who's not in a collective bargaining unit can go to Williston and get a rapid test. And they, after we get tested on Wednesday afternoon, somebody from Williston puts all of those test kits in the car and they drive them right to the lab at the Broad Institute. Because I can't afford in city government if I lose half of the auditing department, I'm down to one. I have one auditor, I have one assistant. You know, we're just so small. We can't, not to mention our public safety, our fire and police, because it goes into overtime and that affects, you know, that, that affects the city budget and we have to keep that down. But the numbers are going up in such erratic ways and community transmission is so hard to contact trace and our ability to contact trace in East Hampton and across Western Mass is going down because of lack of public health nurses. That I actually had testing put in place and we are, we are spending our CARE Act money on those tests for our employees because I am so worried about the frequency of testing and how fast we get them back. And I'm doing that with the full support of the Board of Health and the chair of Board of Health, as well as our public nurse, who we only have access to for another month because she's from Northampton and their cases are going up so fast they can't support us anymore. The governor said today that our positivity rate has yet again increased with no signs of waning. And I understand that schools, you know, Allison is 100% correct. She has metrics and guidelines. I don't see them as mandates because I don't think that DESE has, the, the mandate is only to their own regulation, and it's not mandate to, to law, of, of setting guidelines to get kids back into school, which I am completely for. However, to say that we can do our very best in the school, but there still will be transmission, and we don't know that transmission and don't have access to consistent turnaround tests really concerns me. I know that when there are testing, we're going to have positive cases. I mean, this like it's like the flu, right? I mean, it, things spread in our community, but with COVID-19 and us not knowing what, what we're doing, and we have one of the best testing plans of all the states, um, that those are where my concerns are rooted. Um, that said, I actually have questions. Um, um, Allison, do you... Um, how many, how many kids do we have coming back into our schools right now? Uh, we have... Uh, I mean, roundabout. I'm just trying to get a sense. Yeah, I think we'll be at, like, less than 100 if we add first grade. Okay. I, and that's it's just small. more... Yeah, it, that's just more my curiosity. Um, yeah, 100, 100, then, 100 yeah. to 120, I would say, at the high school. Um, and then the testing on site, um, so 
just to understand, do we, does the school or community have to get to a certain level of positivity or infection spread rate um, to get a, a group of tests for our nurses to use as they see maybe symptoms or have concerns? Um, for the Binax testing that the, um, the Department of Ed is making available to yeah. our district, they're giving us, um, I think it's 40 um, tests to start with in phase one. Yep. And so those tests will be um, for our nurses to use for anyone that it, um, has symptoms or someone yeah. that they feel that they need to check. It's not, we don't have to reach any kind of threshold. Great. We do need to reach a threshold if we call the mobile response unit. That was my next question. And yeah. do we know what that threshold is or does that depend on like what's going on in neighboring cities? I think it, I think it depends because um, I don't know if the public knows this, but if we do get a case yeah. with a, in, that we can prove an in-school transmission, we have to notify the um, Department of Education mm -hmm. and the um, mobile testing unit would come out of there. So Got it's it. really for communities that have um, a cluster of cases in a school or in a classroom, yeah. something that, that is a, a tipping point. Yep. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So, Madam Chair, I guess the question is, it seems like there's two different conversations sort of going on right now. One was the original review of um, the sort of future planning uh, for the school department looking out to January um, and that list. And then I guess whether or not there's a question about our previous approval for first grade to start on Monday. I agree. Um, uh, just, so just to clarify, we pushed the Monday back because we have a, a cohort A and a cohort B. So we pushed, we're starting with cohort B on Thursday and Friday of next week, if you pass that. And then cohort A would go the week of Thanksgiving. They would go on Monday and Tuesday. And that, that way each cohort gets, you know, one, two day sweep in before the Thanksgiving break. So I just want to be clear on the timeline. Well, I would put forward a proposal that we accept um, the superintendent's proposal for January rollout of in-class um, hybrid education for our students uh, and the re, uh, relocation back to their uh, home schools. Uh, based on the um, review of the uh, building uh, analysis that's going to be completed, as well as the uh, health matrix review as we get closer to that time. Do we have a second and do we have any discussion? So we're looking at the January plan. And I have a question. Um, do we anticipate that um, before our next meeting, and I understand that there's been a lot of challenges around the negotiations, but um, I would take a lot of interest in the negotiated number for the per 100,000. I feel like that's an important element of our metric matrix here. Um, and I want to be voting and making decisions based upon these numbers. Uh, and so I find it challenging to make a metric based decision without an understanding of what the, the teachers union has agreed upon as an appropriate, um, you know, an acceptable level of cases. Allison. Um, I think that I would say, I would say two things, Marissa. I would say that the proposal that we put forward for a number is based on, um, a national resource, a health resource. It's not a number that we created on our own. It's based on a medical data point um, that we're aligning it to, number one. Number two, I would say that um, what you're agreeing upon is a plan to bring students back to their schools in a hybrid model 
in January if those pieces are appropriate. So I don't think it's necessary to approve January tonight based on metrics because the, metri it, it, the metrics could change in December and we may have to make a decision in yeah. December to I'm shut not, it down. I'm but not trying to... Yeah, I mean, I'm just. I'm I not think, trying to hold up the vote at this point. No, I'm no, just no, no. putting out there not. that when yeah. we have to make a decision closer to January, right. I will be interested in knowing that number. And if it's, um, if the if this is a national guideline or coming from some external organization that the district has proposed but the union hasn't yet um, accepted, um, is that a number that we can talk about publicly, or should we we and get information about that once the negotiations are. Finalized. I think you have to wait because they haven't accepted. We don't have a tentative agreement on that. Um, I have a question. Would it help in in looking at the January plan if we scheduled a meeting uh, either on the 22nd or the 29th of December to uh, check those? Um, you're laughing, Marin, um, to check those metrics so that you vote with a last look. Because December 8th is a long way away from January 4th. Uh, can, I just, can I just say, as a point of clarification, I think this is, and I think Marin used to this word months ago, this is a goal post that you're putting in the, in right. the sand. There yep. is, there's work that has to happen, um, including securing you know, um, information from families if they're interested to come in. Um, the, getting the bus routes all set. Um, it, it, there's a lot of things that have to happen. So we could pull the plug at the end of December and, and delay the right. start. Right. But I can't wait until... The, like no, no, no. Start the, like parents need to kind of have an idea where the goalpost is. I, am, I, I What I'm saying is if we vote to go forward, we just do a double check when we get closer to that place. Yeah. Would that help? Shannon? I want to second Marin's motion. I think it's really important that we have something that we're working towards. We have to have, we have to be there. And if we change, you know, based on the metrics that we come up with, yeah. I think it's super important that we at least give Allison a guideline and um, at least work toward this. Yep. Any other discussion, Jonathan? Um, so I would say I'm in, I'm in favor of presenting a goalpost. Um, I would say also that I, um, when I voted in favor of um, bringing the first graders back, um, there was an extra sort of layer where those particular students, um, of course, being in significant need themselves, were also um, facing the fact that they had a stunted first year in school last year. Uh, and as we look towards future grades, um, while they're all going to have needs, um, I don't see, I don't have that sort of same piece weighing into it. So as I hear all of this and I think back to um, some of the concerns presented at our last meeting um, by Lori about um, bringing the first graders prior to some of the holidays, um, I'm seeing these dates as basically showing up right after the holidays with a week um, and a half maybe um, uh, padding in between there. And I'm questioning whether or not we're gonna see the full ramifications of um, those events um, in our reflection on the numbers. And um, I also uh, hear this desire or not desire, but like expressed need to um, hunker down as was said and you know, as I think back to the beginning of this whole process, um, one of the things that we were, we felt was very important was to um, be mindful and gradual in our decision making and to act with an abundance of caution. And I'm feeling as though um, to to present the goalpost as it is, uh, as we see numbers rising, um, does not feel abundantly cautious. 
So I know we're trying to, you know, we want to use science in, in all of this and that we're not locking ourselves into anything. Um, but I would prefer, per, you know, from my own sort of stance here um, to see sort of um, the goalpost perhaps a little bit further than it's being presented. So you're thinking that's like, my stance. like January 11th is a start rather than the January 4th. Is that what you're thinking? So I know that um, typically, if I'm not mistaken, the, the sort of halfway mark of the year is generally towards the end of January. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I'm not it's mistaken. That January, I think the semester changes around the 25th. Mm -hmm. and um, I think there's a PD day in there somewhere. So. Um, so from my perspective, you know, especially as we think about um, the changing dynamics of our politics, um, I would say, from my perspective, the end of January would make more sense. But that's just me. Dr. LeClaire, could you put up the, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen again and putting up those dates so we can just see them? Sure. For all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm confused on the, the vote tonight. I, I thought we voted on the, the part through the end of November, like with the, and that what I'm, I'm hearing from the metric report that, that we've met our metrics as we laid out and we already voted. So first graders are set to come back um, the way Allison, you just described it. So, so the motion that's still on the table is we're revoting January. On, January. This is just on January. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And hey, I'm trying. I had I had multiple. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. All right. All right. You want me to scroll down to there? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. So I guess a question that I would have, um, and I, I appreciate Jonathan's um, uh, caution, and I appreciate Jonathan's sort of um, concern, especially around the holidays and making sure that anybody coming back from uh, if they so choose to travel or visit family or anything like that, to have a little bit more of a buffer zone between when they're, they've gone abroad for Christmas, Hanukkah or such, um, and have a chance to come back, have experience of symptoms and be tested. Um, is there a way that, um, say, that January 4th could be push back to the 11th and the 11th could be pushed to the 18th and both the 18th could be both the sort of two through six grades kind of thing to be able to adjust that so that. Hello, Mayor LaChapelle. Thank you for choosing Marriott Hotel. <laughs> Mayor, you're on. Um, anyway, so is that something that would be, do you think a reasonable adjustment to give a little bit more buffer zone? I understand the reason to not wait all the way till the, the end of the semester timing, but um, to give a little bit more buffer zone to allow uh, the holiday travel and impact on testing and such. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, we So just to recap, special pops goes down to the 11th and two through four joins fives and six for the 18th, correct, Marin? That was my question and I would certainly be yep. uh, amendable to adjusting my um, uh, motion to reflect those change in the dates. Does that make sense, Dr. LeClaire? That's fine. I, I like that better. Um, so um, I really like that better. I think that that um, gives a little buffer for people to come back healthy, which is my hope. Well, that's fine. So um, Marin has amended that. Do we have a second for the amended? And just to, you maybe want to maybe point it? out one other thing too. Mm -hmm. So the, to clarify too, the, the, what's listed there as the first piece, the, the special populations pre-K, K-1, those students are currently or will be shortly in school already. 
yep. through December, they'll be in school um, as long as health matrix continue to stay right. low enough. Um, and then it would just be that January uh, 11th, they would be moving back to their original building original school. So the transition. So, I mean, I don't know, I guess I struggle with maybe that one should stay there at the fourth because they're already in school through whatever the last day is the 22nd or 23rd. Um, and then this would just have us have our ability for our custodial staff and everybody to move over holiday vacation, the, all the tools and teaching and classroom setting stuff back to the new building. So that actually, I'm sorry, because I'm realizing that, um, th that make, might make more sense to have that stay over the winter holiday. Um, and that January 4th does get kept there. Um, but then I do think that moving everybody else, not starting until the 18th would still give a, a really solid buffer zone between, um, the, the sort of expansion of our in-school opportunities for students. I certainly agree with that. It would not make sense to bring the um, current students doing hybrid learning back to the high school just to switch them over to their other schools. But so that 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 allows us to to amend this to be able to then um, have our have our buffer um, a significant buffer there for students before after the holidays before they start up in school hybrid education um, in their personal schools. Uh, so that's that that's what I think is. <laughs> That, but that you still, awesome. but you still want on the eleventh the special pops pre K K and one to move into their new buildings. No, I, I, so as she has it listed, leave there, them now, where they are. Four. Okay, got it, it. That would allow everyone to make the move over the holiday break. Got uh, it. As opposed to trying to then squeeze it into some weekend issue, right? Okay, I got it. That makes sense. I like it. Um, any discussion about this new plan? I'm confused. So we've gone back and forth with that special population. So when Jonathan had stated maybe waiting, then I thought we were going to push January 4th to January 11th, meaning those students wouldn't be in person. But were those students supposedly going to be in person? But at the high school and not moved because in my eye, if we want to be safe, we can do all the moving of things, but the students can be remote until after. I'm just not sure but, what we were referring to. Clarify. But the point is, the point is that they're already in the building. They're already being taught. Yeah. This just allows them to move into their old building after um, school vacation, they are already in. So we're not going to put them in remote unless we had to because the metrics were bad. That's what I just want to clarify. If we're voting to set this goalpost, that worries me because it, it seemed like we were doing that with the first graders and the numbers have gone up alarmingly and now they're going back. So I hesitate to vote to move any goalposts for January, not knowing what the metrics are going to be like, nor the testing that will be available. So if we have that, then many parents are going to be excited and think our students are going back. And then are we going to vote and say, no, we're not going to set that goalpost there. We're going to do what our epidemiologist suggested and wait till things are safer in February. See, I don't have a problem with it as a goalpost because many schools that are hybrid right now know that at some point in November or December, they may have to go remote, that it really is uh, dependent on how the health metrics go. Um, but I do think it's a vision for planning for um, getting the kids back into a hybrid model. Um, and that's why I, I just suggested that we vote uh, we vote for this. And if we approve this, then we have a meeting at the end of December just to check those metrics and make sure we can still go forward. 
If I could also um, add, currently, by bringing all that, that first group at the high school, as I mentioned to the mayor, it's maybe 100, 125 students by the time we get all the first graders in. Um, and it's spread out over um, about 15, 16 classrooms. Once we switch back into the buildings, we're talking um, maybe five or six classrooms at Maple, you know, in January with a small number of students and then a handful of classes at Center and a handful of classes at, at Pepin on January 4th. So we add the extra element of really spreading the students out even more amongst the three schools than having them all in one school. So it does add another layer of and kind of kind of spreading them apart. But I'll do but whatever you guys want to do. I just think for planning purposes we need to start we need to start somewhere. I would, I think we're maybe waiting on a second and I would, I would second Marin's amended motion. Shannon actually already seconded it. So I think we're- Oh, off. she did. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we're just in the discussion place. Okay. Any more discussion before we, we vote? Okay, if we're ready for- Can I ask one more quick question? Yes, yes. So there's obviously some pretty substantial variables still in mind here, yes. uh, still in play here. Um, do we have a, um, in terms of getting the, the next report back on phase two of the analysis of the buildings, do we have a projection of when that might be? I'm sorry if you already said that. No, I didn't already say that. I mean, I've said it in a previous meeting. I believe the, the timeline that they presented to us um, they've completed or just about are com have completed all an analysis or visit of all the buildings. Now they're writing up the reports. We were told that they would provide us with individual reports for each building as they completed them. So we are anticipating getting that in the next, in the next few weeks. So it should okay. start rolling in. But we've already begun to start securing some of the products that we'll need. Mm -hmm in anticipation of that. We've been working with the engineers to give us suggestions that are aligned with research. But I, I, I would agree with Cindy. I think it is a good idea for us to set a you know, December 22nd meeting um, to be able to, to sort of get current and maybe a short meeting, but just at least to have that scheduled and to be able to have that as an opportunity to review all these pieces. Yeah, I think every time we've had to make a big decision, that's what we've done is meet just before. So I think that's that's a good idea. Um, so are we ready? Any more questions? Okay. Um, do you want to stop presenting just so I can kind of see and make I'm sure? Sorry. That's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Because I don't want to call for a vote. We've had a motion. It was amended. It got seconded. We discussed it. All right. So let's take a roll call vote. Shannon. Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa. Marissa Cray, aye. Lori. Lori Garcia, abstain. Okay. Marin. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan. Jonathan Schmidt, I'm going to vote no. No. Okay. Okay. Hold on, I just want to make sure I have this right. Oof. Okay. And Mir. You're on mute. My apologies. Uh, Mayor LaChapelle, no. Okay. Okay. All right, so it's up to me. Um, so 
I am really uncomfortable with having a vote that that's that is that close. Um, I know I'm holding everybody up. So we have two no's, an abstention, two yeses. Three yeses. Where did we have a third that I missed? Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. There we go. Mary and Marissa. I knew I wasn't writing one thing down. Okay. Um, so I'm going to vote yes. Um, because I think it's a goalpost that we can we can move back if we have to, but we've got to start try to go forward. Um, so the motion passes very nearly, and I thank everybody for their kind consideration and their careful thought. Um, I am going to definitely ask that we meet for December twenty second to do a final look at these metrics. Um, that would really be um, because we have to give some notice that would be kind of our last chance to put a stop on this if things are not going well. So I, I will be scheduling a December 22nd meeting just to look at that. Okay. So the motion has passed. Do we want to or need to discuss first grade? We have already voted. Um, the only consideration would be to change it. And um, I'm thinking that unless someone is wanting to bring that up, that we simply go forward. We're already in plans to get it started. It's going to be two days before Thanksgiving for each group. And we're taking baby steps and we'll know if we're working. Um, I'm a little confident, even though the numbers are scaring me, I, I'm a little more confident because I have seen hybrid working um, when it is done diligently. And I think that we're going to be very careful. We know we're taking baby steps. So I think that we, we can start. I mean, I'm feeling pretty confident that we can go forward. I'm also feeling very confident that at a moment's notice, we might have to just go back period. And every school I know is facing that, that they have to be ready to go remote in a flash. And the only reason why I jumped um, when Dr. LeClaire was talking about cities going red is I think that we have to stick with our plans, our numbers, our safety metrics, rather than worry about the state. And I wanted to make sure we were really clear on that. So, all right, thank you. Um, the last thing is superintendent goals. Yes, because we need more to do right now. <laughs> um, well, it is, you know, it is November, so you should be demanding my goals of me. Um, and I think it is important that as the leader of the district, I model that uh, we are expecting goals of our staff. Our staff is um, beginning to work on their goals for the year. And um, as my administrators are as well. So I think it's important for everyone to be aware that this is, um, you know, some small degree of normalcy for us as, as educators, we are learners. And so we're always working on something you know, we're always working to improve in some area, to um, learn something new, to reflect on things. So this is where we are this year. So um, let me first point out that for both the administrators and for um, the teachers, the Department of Ed in their wisdom has decided to set aside the larger document um, that we are used to for evaluation. Teachers and administrators do not need to um, focus on every standard and every indicator this year. It's been streamlined. Um, so for administrators, I'm demonstrating to you right now, I'm showing you 
what the standards are for administrators. So these are the standards. Standard 1A is curriculum, 1B is instruction, standard 2A is environment, and 2B is HR management. I have a one sheet that I'll give you after. Uh, standard 3C is family communication, and standard 4B is cultural proficiency. Um, the teachers have similar standards. So we're not expecting to evaluate our staff on, for any standards except for the standards and indicators that are aligned in DESE's new guidance for this year only. It's not a permanent change, but it is something that they're just trying to streamline the process this year, understanding that it's, an, it's new. This is a new way of educating for all of us. So as um, in previous years, every educator has professional practice goals and we also have uh, student-centered goals. So the professional practice goal, uh, this is a goal that my team has developed to foster a deeper understanding of common practices for providing effective leadership that utilizes technology and online resources during remote and hybrid learning. We wanted to set a professional practice goal that is aligned to the current circumstances that we're dealing with in our schools right now. Uh, and we have uh, this goal is um, something all the administrators will use and they'll share it with their staff so their staff can develop a teacher goal around this. We have uh, key actions and benchmarks for, and I won't read them all. I'm gonna provide this with to all the uh, school committee. But one of the things that we'll do is share articles at the leadership level. We'll provide agendas of our leadership team meetings. Uh, right now, we are only meeting once a week as a leadership team. Throughout the summer, we were meeting multiple times a week. Uh, in comparison to a regular school year, we would probably meet every other week. But there's just such an urgency to everything now that it's important for us to be in constant contact with one another. So as you are probably aware, there have been a lot of technology additions to make remote um, and hopefully hybrid learning more effective and efficient. A lot of training is taking place. So we'll be evaluating that as we go throughout the year. And then I have some district improvement goals, engaging families and students in remote and hybrid models of learning that prioritize the social emotional learning, health and safety of all of our school community members in academic progress and achievement. So again, looking for that social aspect, but also looking for the academic aspect of the remote and hybrid models and really making connections with families that we have um, not had as much of in the past. I think that families are real partners this year in um, remote learning. And we have key action steps, uh, communicating models to stakeholders. Uh, I have, uh, tomorrow I'll be working on a school committee update that I'll send out to staff and families by the end of the week, just to summarize what happened at our school committee meetings. I have found from feedback from some of the families that they don't watch these long, long meetings because they have families, but they wanna get a sense of what was discussed, what was accomplished. So we'll do that. Lots of family surveys. We've been doing that at the district level, at the school building level, um, and all the other things that we've been doing, just doing, um, there are parent-teacher conferences going on um, over the next few weeks. Those all look very different this year, so it's all new for us. District improvement goal number two, climate and culture. Improve the climate and culture in all district schools by developing a plan for district alignment of equity initiatives. Um, again, the equity work, we do not want it to go away. And I know there are several people on this committee that are involved in equity initiatives, the um, steering committee. We're also starting a social justice and equity um, group 
at the elementary level, and there was talk today about moving it to the middle school level, a similar group. So we're working on um, making adjustments to curriculum, and it's just something that, it's work that we want to continue on in our district, even though our agreement with the Attorney General's office has, has come to its, its end point. We wanna make sure that we are still working on that goal. Um, and so I'll go, I went over some of these. Uh, school building project, the third and final goal, fully supporting and promoting the school building project um, by fulfilling all the MSBA requirements and ensuring the community is fully informed about the project and understands why it is the most cost-effective and educationally appropriate solution for the East Hampton Public Schools. Um, I'm sure that everyone on this call uh, realizes that as that project ramps up, it takes an awful lot of the uh, of our time in meetings and decision making. Um, you know, we finished all the interior design decisions. All the furniture has been selected at this point. The orders will go in shortly for the bid process on all the furniture. There's just a lot of steps that are involved, and it involves not just me, but it involves a lot of my staff as well as a lot of the administrators are involved in making sure that the appropriate equipment is available in classrooms and we have all the um, appropriate setups so that the building is successful from day one. So those are the um, goals. And I did, I did have a one page kind of cheat sheet that I will share out with all of you around the goals. And as I mentioned, um, it's a little bit more streamlined. It's a little bit more condensed this, this year because of the direction from the Department of Ed, but that will be carried through to the school administrators and to the teachers as well. So um, I'm open for any questions that you might have. Shannon? I was just asking if you could send it to us. Oh, yes. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll send you the one page sheet. Yep. Oh, not the whole. So do you want the whole? I can send you both. I'll send you both. Yeah, because we usually use it when we do the evaluations. Yes, I'll send you both. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Any I questions that brief because I know we were getting late. Yeah, no, I just want to point out I appreciate um, all the different pieces. I mean, it's it's sort of uh, pulling together succinctly all the different things that we're still having to work on, even though we're in a pandemic and all of our sort of standard processes are kind of thrown up in the air. I appreciate you putting this forward and, and bringing it to us and, and keeping an eye on all the different pieces from our new building to student learning, all those different pieces. So thank you very much for presenting us the inf this information. And I feel like it's a, it's a good support for us to be able to see what you're working on and, and agree to you right now. You need us to approve your goals, correct? Uh, yes, I believe you do need to take a vote. Yeah. So any discussion? Do we have a motion to approve Dr. LeClaire's goals? I'll move we approve the superintendent's goals as presented. Okay. I'll second that. All right. Any more discussion? Roll call vote. Darren Dunham, aye. Marissa Cray, aye. Laura Garcia, aye. Darren Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. No, you're on mute, Mayor. Sorry about that. Uh, Mayor Lushpel, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. Great. Thank you. I'm all set. Thank you. All right. So we have um, matters for action, payroll, and accounts payable. Didn't lose my agenda this time. All right. I move to approve the school payroll dated 11-5-2020 in the amount of $519,583.35. I'll second. Okay, Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Curry, aye. Laurie Garcia, aye. Marin Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Mayor LaChapelle, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. I move to approve the accounts payable authorization for payment dated 11-5-2020 in the amount of $89,001.23. I'll second. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Marissa Curry, aye. 
Laurie Garcia, aye. Baron Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Mayor LaChapelle, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. Um, so does anybody have anything under other before we ask for a motion to adjourn? All righty. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I would like to make a motion that we adjourn. A second. Okay. Shannon? Shannon Dunham, aye. Bye. <laughs> Marissa Curry, aye. Laurie Garcia, aye. Aaron Goldstein, aye. Jonathan Schmidt, aye. Mayor Lushfell, aye. Cynthia Kwasinski, aye. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good See night. You. Night. See you on December 8th.